Hi, and welcome back to Small Caps. My name is Jess Fertig, and today we are ch chatting with ASX listed International Graphite. ASX ticker code is IG6. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome back the Managing Director and CEO of IG6, Mr. Andrew Warland. Um, hi, Andrew. It's great to have you back on the show. Hey, Jess. Good to be back. So, Andy, it's been a very busy last couple of weeks since we last caught up. Um, yep. So let's just delve straight in. Congratulations, first of all, on your placement that you've just announced this week. Can you tell us more, Caps audience, more about what's going on? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jess. Uh, yeah, we came out of a trading halt uh, this morning announcing that we completed a, a placement for $3 million uh, and uh, we're looking to conduct a share purchase plan for the for, for all shareholders Um and the offer period will open um, very soon for that. So looking to raise another million dollars there with the ability to take some over subscriptions as well. I think it'll be pretty well supported. Um, uh, we think it's really good pricing and um, and uh, in, in a way, uh, it's not quite as, you know, we would all like to have hoped that the pricing would have been um, further north than where it was, where, where we did it. But, um, you know, the market is what the market is and you have to, you have to respond to it. And so we have. We've raised that money. Um, we'll raise the money in the SPP, and that'll keep us uh, certainly um, with with sufficient cash to progress all, all of the really material aspects of our technical studies over the next six to nine months, and hopefully wrap up our Springdale feasibility study by the end of this calendar year. So, um, good 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 news for us, uh, and just just more exciting times for us in terms of how we're going to develop our projects. Yeah, fantastic, Andy. And um, well, I think it's a massive milestone for the company raising capital, as you mentioned, particularly in this market, albeit, you know, yes. not always at the price that you want. And I think that's that's generally a consistent theme across, um, you know, companies raising capital. Now, I, yeah. I understand that you're um, undertaking a share purchase plan or an SPP. Can you tell us a little bit more about that as well? Yeah, so what that does is gives all, all of our shareholders that own whether they own um, 40 million shares or they own one share, the opportunity to participate uh, and take up um, certain increments of, of shares in, in bands of up to $30,000 per shareholder. Um, so that, uh, it's, an, it's an interesting form of capital raise It's because it obviously gives those shareholders that are smaller on the register the chance to take perhaps more than they would have from an entitlement perspective under a, a, your rights issue. So, so it's particularly attractive for, for smaller shareholders. Um, and we have 17 or 800, 1700 or 800, 1800 shareholders in our register. And so we'd be, um, we think we'll get a, a good take up from, from those shareholders. And we certainly as a, a board and management team are going to participate and lead from the front. On that topic, I should just mention that Phil Hurst took, um, invested $200,000, our chairman and founder, into the placement. So he's shown great leadership, I think, and a vote, great vote of confidence um, for all of our shareholders to follow. Yeah, that's fantastic. And it's it's always such a great validation um, outwardly for other investors to see management, um, you know, supporting the SPP and, and, and taking up allocation. So now um, you mentioned, Andy, uh, sort of pre-feasibility work that needs to be finished. What else will the funding be used for specifically? Well, most of that funding, Jess, will will go towards Springdale. Um, there will be some funding that uh, will, will be used to match some of the grant that we received on Saturday. Um, I'm sure we'll come to that in a moment. Um, that was awarded by the, the state government, the $6.5 million grant. Two million of that grant has been dedicated to developing our battery and O facilities in, in Collie, or the, the technical work around the battery and O facilities in Collie. And so some of the funding that we raised uh, in, we'll raise in this placement and the SPP will be directed towards uh, matching that funding. Um, but but the the, the, bo the the remainder of that funding will go towards finishing off uh, further drilling down at um, Hopeton, uh, at our, uh, on the on the mineral resource, uh, some exploration drilling, um, and a lot of the technical drilling that needs to be done around metallurgy, geotechnical, hydrology that'll support the the project development and the feasibility study and permitting process. Oh, fantastic, Annie. Now, staying along track with the funding theme, congratulations also on securing additional funding uh, funding grants from the WA government. Can you elaborate for us on how those funds in particular will be used to accelerate um, the company's micromising project in Collie? 
Sure. So uh, we were thrilled on on Saturday to attend a, an event with the Premier uh, and the uh, and uh, and the Minister Minister Punch with respect to uh, the grant that the state government has awarded to us for the development of the micronising facility in Collie, as well as um, battery anode test work for to support the Springdale to Collie mine to market strategy. Um, it, it has been awarded from the Collie Transition Fund, which is a fund that the state government set up to assist the township of Collie transition from its historical uh, sources of employment and income, being the coal mining um, industry, and out into broader industries and attract attract new businesses into Collie to <clears throat> to um, repurpose, if you like, the town um, into into new industries and. Um, and so we we received that six and a half million dollar grant. Um, we had that announcement down at our light industrial area where we've got our um, research and development plant installed, and uh, it's since been expanded, as you know, to the to the larger qualification micronising plant. And this funding will then in turn expand that further to a a commercial scale facility. So. We, we see the micronising facility and operation as a way of getting into the graphite market ahead of the, the more traditional evolution and life cycle of a, of a mining company where you, 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 know, you develop your mine and then you develop your downstream for that mine. Whilst we're doing all of that development work, we see this as a great opportunity to get into to the marketplace at a, at a modest cash flow treating imported concentrates initially um, and developing a suite of graphite products for various markets, um, with both industrial applications and, and battery applications. Um, and so we'll build, a, we'll, build, we'll build up a significant amount of IP, um, graphite expertise, and obviously processing skills um, that are going to benefit for us in the in the overall battery anode world because the micronising step is the first step of the production of battery anode materials. So, so it's a, it's a really important we think um, differentiator for us, um, and we can sh we should be able to do it at a pretty uh, modest cost of capital for our equity holders. So those that are in subscribing to this this round of the um, SPP and to the placement and existing shareholders, we think will um, get a really good really good bang for that uh, for that dollar for this through this micronising plant that probably isn't getting a lot of value in the marketplace from a you know from a C3 perspective when you look at our valuation. Yeah this is so interesting Andy. Now I also understand that the Western Australian government is sort of trying to position itself as a clean energy hub in Australia. How do you think the company's project you know, potentially contributes to that vision of the WA government, and and how will will the project benefit the Collie region? Do you think? Okay, so in terms of the Collie region itself, mm -hmm. um, the first the first step in our our facilities will generate probably twenty to thirty jobs over the expansion process. We we had thirty individual contractors and um, consultants involved in just the establishment of the light industrial area itself. So, and they are tr predominantly trade skills, technicians and um, process engineers and so forth, um, fitters, um, mechanical engineers, those, those, sort of, those sort of skills that have been, um, you know, that, have, that have existed for the coal industry in particular can, can sort of repurpose into the sort of facilities that we're, that we're um, implementing. So, so we, we created a lot of opportunity in the construction phase and then the permanent employment phase going forward will be you know, consider, a considerable employer within the within the non-mining related sector of Collie. Um, when we actually go to build the battery anode facilities, uh, we're looking at upwards of 80 to 100 people um, that'll be that'll be employed in in those operations. So that would make us a you know a very very significant employer in in, in the township and in the sort of that the, the broader Collie um, Shire itself. So um, so we will we will make a significant contrib contribution to to the local economy. Um, there's no doubt about that. Um, the first question you asked, yes, just. To remind me was about new, um, the energy. That's yeah. right. Um, how, how you think the IG Sixes IG Sixes project will contribute to the vision of this clean energy hub that the WA government is trying to sort of instill? Yeah. So, so the, the premier reiterated when he was um, uh, doing announcing the grant to the media that was assembled in our light industrial area um, shed that uh, that they were very committed to the 
just solar and wind power generation um, within that uh, within that southwest corridor. So the the number of wind farms that are going up around sort of the the, the broader Collie um, region, uh, as far as Co and as far north as Co uh, far south as Cogent up, for example, uh, will will ultimately disseminate that power through to Collie and Collie is going to remain the centre for the, the transmission of power throughout the state. Well, certainly up to as north, far north as Kalbarri and as far as east as, as Kalgoorlie and north through the southwest. So Collie is still going to be the mecca for, for power um, transmission. And from our perspective, uh, we're, we're going to be a considerable user of, of power, perhaps up to 20 to certainly 20 meg um, of power when we when we start the purification process. And then when we go to coat, our battery anode materials would be potentially up to 30 to 40 meg of power there. So we'll be a significant consumer and a significant offtake partner for the state with respect to power. Um, and therefore, um, you know, we'll be, we expect to be able to be a major contributor towards the demand side of, of the renewable energy hub that the government's looking to install throughout that region. Yeah, that's so, so good, Andy. And so now we've covered a little bit about the benefits um, to the Collie region in terms of the local community <clears throat> in, um, in, in our last question. I'm quite interested to know a little bit more about, um, you know, how confident the company is in securing a customer base, though, for your uh, micronizing uh, graphite products especially in light of, you know, the growing demand of battery metals? Yeah, so um, the, the theme internationally is, is really, really strong with uh, the need to diversify the supply chains away from China. Um, mm -hmm. We just saw it this week, actually, the International Energy Association came out with their electric vehicles report. And the growth rates that we're seeing out of um out of North America and Europe in particular are, are quite staggering. So the so the the if you like if you look at the trend for electric vehicle and therefore battery storage take up um, globally through to the next to 2035, it really is going at an enormous pace. And and so we're getting a lot of inbound calls from groups associated with those giga, giga factories to look to um, supply them with with both sort of micronized products that that can then go into further into the battery chain or actually that's the full the full um the full product itself whether it be a purified uncoated product or a coated product um so you know it for us it's going to be about continuing the hard work of developing the assets and de-risking them as much as possible and at, at a point we'll be able to offer those customers the the perfect offtake and investment opportunity that will maximize the value for our shareholders um, so we, we, you know, we, 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 we see just, if you like, an insatiable demand coming out of North America and Europe in particular, and some of that is being spearheaded by Japan and Korea. Um, and so, yeah, we, we're very confident about our capability of, of delivering a strategic investor and a customer base that will help underwrite the projects. Yeah, that, that is really, really fantastic, Andy, and, and obviously validated by the government because you've been now received both state and federal funding um, from, from the government. Um, can you speak to the the importance of government support for, you know, developing a robust critical minerals industry in Australia, just broadly? Yeah, I, I think it's it's vital because... The, the challenge that we all have is that we're up against, if you like, a, a, a producer and consumer of materials that is heavily government um, subsidised, which is China. Um, and they have a 20 to 30 year head start across a, a range of commodities that are, that are critical to the sort of the, the decarbonisation process. And, and so, and, and further to that, the markets that we're operating are reasonably opaque. So you know they don't have the volume of, of of tonnage that you see for commodities that's hitting on the LME, and investment banks can get very comfortable with the forward curves of of various commodities and so forth. Um, none of the lithiums and the the rare earths and the the graphites uh, have that sort of attribute, and so you need another lever in there to sort of help help them um, to help these projects. Get to market, and so government support is critical. And last week we saw Renascor in the graphite space um, uh, release a statement regarding a hundred eighty-five million dollar project loan facility for for their for their uh, for their mine and concentrator. And that's fantastic news for the for the industry. I think, and, 
And it's a great move by the Australian government because it, it recognises that these facilities are, are, are very difficult to build when markets are particularly opaque. And so you really, there are two, two things that are going to be need to lead the way. One is sort of a degree of government support and the other is the consumer and the customer base that we just talked about. So um, it's great from our perspective to see that the Australian government uh, at, a, at a federal level um, develop, looking to, to help companies develop projects to that to that extent. You know, these are these are project loans, ultimately. They're not gifts. So, so they have to be commercial and they have to be repaid. And so... The government isn't um, the, the taxpayer isn't being asked to fund something that's not a commercially viable opportunity. But the government is stepping in where other banks may think that the risk is just something that they can't at this point in time understand appropriately. So, um, so they're going to they're going to uh, play a vital role, and, and the state governments themselves, I think, will be playing uh, equally important role, but perhaps more at the micro level um, than at the macro level in project development. Yeah, so interesting, Andy. Um, yeah, I mean, all of those things that you mentioned are just, you know, super, super critical. And again, you know, having state and federal government funding, you know, into IG6 is further validation because, as you said, you know, these aren't gifts, these are loans, um, and yeah. taxpayers need to see sort of outcomes that, that go into yeah. the funding initiatives from the government? Yes, yeah, cert certainly, Jess. The, the, the money we've received today have been grants, but um, but when you get into the world of project development and sort of you know, um, then you are into the loan to the loan world, and that's where the, the more significant sums of money will come into play and they have to be commercially viable um, yeah. forms of capital. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Thank you for that distinction and for our audience yeah. as well. Um, yep. Now, Andy, I have just one final question for you, as always, the same question, and that is, please, as, as the story develops and changes and advances, can you please provide our Small Caps audience with two or three key takeaways as to why they should put IG6 on their investor watch list? Well, I think the first key takeaway was highlighted in the international uh, um, energy association report of this week, and that is that the demand for lithium-ion batteries in both the electric vehicles and the stationary storage market is is as strong as it's ever been. The 2023 statistics, even though you might have heard some whispers at the back end of last year regarding um, you know, sales volumes sort of falling away, they're, they're doing so on a percentage basis term compared to the previous quarter of the previous year. But if you look at it at a, on an annual basis, the, the growth rate's still extraordinary. Um, and for 2023, electric vehicles globally more or less hit their uh, forecast targets of 13 to 14 million um, ton, uh, 13 to 14 million vehicles sold, new vehicles sold, and that trajectory is just is growing further. In the first quarter of this year, we've seen another quarterly record for for the March quarter set. So, so the theme, the macro theme, remaining very strong, and Europe and North America in particular are, uh, are readily accelerating there their electric vehicle um, production. The, the, so that, that would be the first takeaway. So from the, on, on the demand side, I would urge investors to to remain very positive. The statistics are all very strong and positive about that and not to be not to be overly influenced by you know, month to month or week to week sort of fluctuations and, and reporting. The second thing I would say about uh, international graphite is we still remain really, really strong value. Um, I think I said that to you on your uh, on your pre on our, on our previous call, Jess, that um, relative to where our peers are, who have been at the at this game a little bit longer than we have, and have got more maturity into their particularly their mining assets, uh, we think that we're on the tra we're on the right trajectory to deliver a feasibility study for Springdale by the end of this year, and then you can have a real uh, we're at the point where you can do a real rating um, between various companies and projects, and I think that our value then should appreciate considerably up to the levels where you see um, some of our peers like Renascor and, and Talga um, and Nouveau Monde over in Canada. So, so that I would sort of urge shareholders to do a bit of a peer peer review, take a look at the, our risk assessment on on our asset development and the characteristics of our project and, and form a view on the value. We think we think there's a real value driver and opportunity there for, for investors. Yeah, thanks so much, Andy. Yeah, definitely um, some very strong mac macro tailwinds um, in, in this sector. And yeah, as you mentioned, uh, a lot of value, hidden value still. Um, and, you know, you've just done a raise at a discounted share price. 
Um, so again, a lot of a lot more value for for investors to come in and buy on market, potentially. Yep. Indeed. <laughs> Well, wonderful, Andy. As always, it's so great to catch up with you and um, to, to to watch the company as it progresses and advances and really looking forward to having you back on the show again soon. Excellent, Jess. Look forward to it.